Hi folks. Before we get into this episode, I want to talk about UK True Crime Podcast. It's a podcast which focuses on the lesser known crimes which have taken place primarily in the UK. And it also offers new perspectives and insights into stories you may already know. It's hosted by Adam, and if you like the style of the Troubles podcast, then this one is for you, with his delivery being direct and straight to the point. With a library of over 300 episodes, there are plenty to check out. And he also has some relating to the Troubles as well. You can listen by searching UK True Crime Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Now, let's get into it. Saturday evening in the small town of Enniskillen. As preparations are underway for the Remembrance Day Parade happening the next day, the caretaker of the Reading Room's social club is finishing up a game of cards with his friends. It's late and he's about to lock up when he thinks he hears the sound of muffled footsteps upstairs in what was meant to be an empty building. He thinks nothing of it and locks up for the night. Unbeknownst to him, a bomb had been planted there that was timed to go off in a few hours and the devastation that followed the next morning would be considered a turning point in the history of the Troubles. It also raised the question, where were the IRA getting their explosives from? That answer would take us to North Africa. And in this episode, we'll be learning about the bombing as well as where the explosives came from. This is the Troubles podcast, a podcast about the violence and bloodshed that occurred in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, as multiple sides and organisations waged a bloody conflict over the status of Northern Ireland. Remembrance Sunday is a special day for people in the United Kingdom and other countries which make up the Commonwealth around the world. It is a day which commemorates the contribution of British and Commonwealth military and civilian servicemen and women in the two world wars, as well as later conflicts. Usually it's held on the nearest Sunday to November 11th, which is Armistice Day, the anniversary of the end of World War I. To mark this day, people usually wear a red poppy on their chest, and there are a number of ceremonies held at war memorials, many of which can be found in towns around Northern Ireland. Many Irish people did die in the First World War, with the figure sitting around 35,000. Then in the Second World War, between five to 10,000 Irish people also died. But traditionally, nationalists in Northern Ireland, as well as people in the Republic of Ireland, would not celebrate Remembrance Day, as it was seen as a memorial to the British Army, which would not be something many people in Ireland would be in favour of supporting, as a result of Ireland's complicated history. Though in recent years things have changed, and more moderate nationalists have taken part in memorials to show support for the Unionist population, as well as honouring the Irish people who died fighting as part of the British Army. In Northern Ireland, Remembrance Day was also a chance for people to honour the members of the RUC police force who were killed during the Troubles. One such town where this would take place is Enniskillen. It's the largest town in the Northern Irish county of Fermanagh and made up of around 65% Catholics with the remaining 35% Protestant or other religions. The British Army patrolled Fermanagh, which would have been considered a remote Protestant community in the far southwest corner of Northern Ireland. The IRA wanted to make this part of the countryside ungovernable and to essentially claim the territory and take it away from the British Army. In Enniskillen, a number of members of the security services were killed by IRA bombs from the 70s onwards, but it was what happened in 1987 that would make headlines around the world. But we'll get to that. During the 1980s in Northern Ireland, the Provisional IRA were making advances politically under the strategy of the Armalite and the Ballot Box. The IRA would achieve their aims either through violence or through politics. In the wake of the hunger strikes, their political wing, Sinn Féin, started to gain more and more traction and by 1987 they were hand in hand with the IRA. But abandoning violence and taking a complete political approach was not yet on the table for Sinn Féin. In fact, it would appear that the IRA were actually ramping up their efforts for violence in Northern Ireland. Their intention was to wage a war of attrition against the British Army. 
For those who are unaware what attrition means, it's the process of reducing something's strength or effectiveness through sustained attack or pressure. So to do this, the IRA needed to have enough resources. In the early days of the Troubles, they fought using pre-World War II weapons, and then later on relying on shipments from the USA. To get explosives, quarries and mines around the Republic of Ireland were raided, but these would soon be locked down, and any time explosives were to be used, the Irish army would supervise to prevent any theft. The British government was aware of this, and they wanted to find a way to starve the IRA of their ability to get weapons into the country, as well as prevent them from getting the money to purchase weapons. But there was one man who was happy to provide the IRA with as much money and weaponry as they wanted, as long as they used it against his enemy, the British government. And that man was Muammar Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi was the de facto leader of the North African country of Libya after staging a coup d'etat in 1969. He transformed Libya into a new socialist state, but his leadership proved to be unpredictable and controversial, and many people around the world perceived him to be a dictator, with the US President Ronald Reagan giving him the nickname the Mad Dog of the East. Gaddafi was unusual with his style and would wear traditional Bedouin clothes and sleep in a bulletproof tent while on state visits to other countries. In the 1980s, he travelled with a cabal called the Amazonian Guard, who were his all-female personal security, who had apparently sworn a vow of celibacy to be by his side. Though in later years, many of the women came out and said that they had been raped by Gaddafi while working for him. Gaddafi had a very strained relationship with the Western powers, and viewed the United Kingdom as imperialists. Things escalated in 1984, when a British police officer was shot dead while patrolling a demonstration outside the Libyan embassy in London. The shot was fired from inside the embassy. As a result of this incident, diplomatic relations between the two countries were severed and Libyan diplomats were escorted out of the UK. Then, in 1986, the US bombed Libya. They did this for a number of reasons. Gaddafi was firmly anti-Israel and supported a number of violent organisations in Palestine and Lebanon. Libya also occupied the country of Chad, as the two countries share a border. Chad was rich in uranium deposits and the US was concerned that Libya was trying to become a nuclear power. Gaddafi was also a strict Muslim and wanted to set up a federation of Arab and Muslim states in Northern Africa, which is something that the US was against. Then, in 1986, there was a terror attack in a nightclub in Berlin in Germany. Three people were killed two of them being American soldiers. It was alleged by the US that this attack was carried out by Libyan agents acting under Gaddafi's instruction, though others investigating the bombing found no proof that linked the attack to Gaddafi. Nine days after this attack, the US bombed Tripoli, the capital city of Libya, killing around 45 people. This bombing was widely condemned around the world, but did receive support from a number of countries, including the UK, Canada, Australia and Israel. The United Kingdom went one step further than vocally supporting this bombing by allowing the planes that carried out the bombings to take off and land in their air bases, which made Gaddafi furious. He said of British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, quote, Thatcher is a murderer. She allowed planes to be sent from her country knowing that they intended to attack my home and family. Thatcher is a prostitute. She sold herself to Reagan and now she sold her country too. One way of retaliating against the UK was to support its enemies, one of which was the provisional IRA. Gaddafi believed that they were engaged in a liberation struggle. We believe uh, they have just cause, because uh, Irish is Irish and uh, Britain is uh, Britain. We consider uh, the existence of Britain in the north of Irish is a kind of uh, imperialism. Gaddafi decided to start sending shipments of arms and cash to the IRA. This first began in the 1970s after holding secret meetings with them. I found one source saying that these secret meetings were arranged by the Soviet Union. The first shipment of arms into Ireland arrived around 1972-1973 with the next shipment being seized by the Irish Gardaí in 1973, containing around five tonnes of weapons. 
It's estimated that around three other shipments made it into Ireland around this time. Contact then stopped in 1976, but resumed in 1984. Circumstances had changed. Gaddafi was very impressed with the IRA and the hunger strikes that had happened in 1981. And then with all the things that had gone on between Libya and the UK, he decided to ramp things up and provide the IRA with a massive amount of weapons, explosives and ammunition. All for free. Libya started sending in some serious munitions, and in particular, Semtex explosives. Semtex is odourless and invisible to X-ray, and it's estimated that nearly every IRA bomb detonated from 1986 onwards contained Semtex from a Libyan shipment. It's also believed that around 30 IRA members travelled to Libya for weapons training, specifically in the SAM-7 missiles, which could take down helicopters, and would be too suspicious if the IRA men tried to practice with them in Ireland. The overall plan this time was to stagger the shipment of arms and weaponry, and not to use any Libyan weapons until all shipments had arrived in Ireland, and then the IRA was planning to launch a surprise offensive against the British Army. The IRA were modelling their upcoming attack on the Tet Offensive, which occurred during the Vietnam War. They would launch a surprise attack on a number of different locations simultaneously and hold areas in Armagh, Tyrone and Fermanagh, denying ground to the British forces. The SAM missiles would be used to take down British helicopters in South Armagh, and then there was also a plan to mount cannons on boats which would take out a British Navy patrol boat in Carlingford. There were even plans to blow up a ship at the mouth of Belfast Harbour, blocking other military vessels from entering. This whole offensive was based entirely around the element of surprise. Any leak would compromise the entire thing. This brings us to October 30th, 1987, where we find a mid-sized, unassuming ship marooned off the coast of France. The steering had failed and the ship was drifting closer and closer to the French shore. Named the Exund, it was a Panamanian registered vessel and Irishman Gabriel Cleary didn't know what to do. Gabriel was a member of the IRA and was in charge of the operation that was going on. He had seen the same plane pass by a number of times and was convinced that they were being watched. He knew they would be boarded soon, so he knew he had to scuttle the ship before that happened. He had placed 12 small explosive charges that he could detonate with the press of a button and then he and the crew would get into a life raft but when he checked the mechanism, he realised that it had been sabotaged. So which member of the crew did it? So with no way of scuttling the ship, they continued to float listlessly until French authorities arrived and boarded. And when they searched the ship, they found a massive cache of weapons and ammunition, leading to a great deal of confusion. Where were these weapons going? The skipper of the Exund was brought to Brest in Brittany, France, and was interviewed by the police, who were trying to figure out who he was and where he was headed. The man said his name was Adrian John Hopkins, and that he was contacted recently by an individual who he had known for a long time, Henry Kearns, who told him that he knew a businessman who wanted to purchase a cargo ship. One of the main sources for this episode is a BBC documentary, saying he once owned a horse-drawn carriage tourist business, but then its offices mysteriously burned down. He then set up a travel agency, which went bust. By the mid-80s, he had developed a business buying, selling and delivering boats, but the seizure of the Exxon put an end to that. The documentary is a little bit outdated, but I'll explain where when we get there. Upon being interrogated, Adrian's story was that he bought the boat and delivered it to Malta, to Henry Kearns. When he arrived, he met Henry and the three other crew members, but there was no captain. They then asked him if he would do the job and he agreed. Then, two hours out to sea, one of the men came up to him and explained that he and the other men were members of the provisional IRA. They then gave him two choices. One, get very well paid, and the other was that his family would be safe. He took that as a threat and agreed to continue on the journey with the men. He then explained that he'd been told to take the Exxon to Libya to Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, where they would fill the ship with weapons, ammunition and money. Inside the Exund, there was a huge amount of munitions, including mortars, AK-47s, 
flamethrowers, Semtex explosives, and surface-to-air missiles. Hopkins maintained that he had no knowledge that the Exxon's intention was to deliver arms, but he soon wore down after a few days, revealing that he was aware of what he'd been doing and had been doing so for a number of years. His reasoning was that he was offered a significant sum of money for the jobs and badly needed the money at the time. He then dropped a bombshell, revealing that over the last two years, he had already landed four Libyan shipments in Ireland, estimating around 100 to 130 tonnes of arms. The BBC documentary went on to reveal what else had been landed at Clogger Strand in the Irish county of Wicklow, which included 36 rocket launchers, 10 SAM-7 missiles, 26 heavy machine guns, hundreds of rifles, thousands of rounds of ammunition, over 200 grenades, 10 flamethrowers, and a significant amount of Semtex explosives. As well as that, the Libyans had provided the IRA with around $10 million in cash. From my research for this episode, some Republicans have said that the weapons supplied were useless for the type of close combat, guerrilla-style warfare tactics of the Troubles, but I did find one instance of a flamethrower being used by the IRA in 1989 during the attack on the Dairy Yard checkpoint, which saw two British soldiers killed in the attack. The revelation that four shipments had already arrived in Ireland was deeply surprising especially since it hadn't been on the radar of British and Irish intelligence before the interception of the Exund. Though, in 1986, the Irish Gardaí did find a weapons dump in Ireland, which had a number of weapons and then a box of ammo saying Libyan Armed Forces. But it's unclear if they followed up on this. But one thing was clear. These shipments that had already arrived meant that the provisional IRA would be well armed for decades to come. But, with the capture of the Exund, the element of surprise was gone, and the IRA's Tet Offensive was scuppered. British Army helicopters could electronically jam the signal of the SAM missiles, and they also began flying in groups of five, so if one was attacked, the other four would chase the attacker. So how did the Exund get caught? The BBC documentary I referenced in this episode states that it was a chance encounter by the French Navy as a result of a faulty rudder. And this was the narrative that was put out for years, that it was a disaster for British intelligence. But there was a lot more to it. Ed Maloney writes in his book, The Secret History of the IRA, that they were informed upon and the ship was sabotaged. So who was the saboteur? On board the ship was Adrian Hopkins, the captain, who was not a member of the IRA, but he was doing these jobs for money. It's believed that Hopkins told the authorities everything upon his arrest which was an offence which could easily see him killed in the eyes of the IRA. But in the end, they decided that the negative PR from killing him wouldn't be worth it, so they let him off, advising him that it would be unwise for him to write a book about his endeavours, which he had planned to do. Hopkins may have divulged everything to the police upon his arrest, but was it him who sabotaged the explosive charges? There were three IRA members on the Exund, Gabriel Cleary, James Call and James Doherty. Both Jameses were from Donegal, with Gabriel hailing from Dublin. There was also Henry Kearns, who was Adrian's friend and business partner. Both Henry and Adrian were not in the IRA. Gabriel was one of the IRA's most skilled bomb makers and was overseeing the entire operation of bringing the weapons over from Libya. He was the one who set up the booby trap, which would sink the Exxon if they were in trouble. And it was him who had checked it when they had set sail. It was in full working order when they had set sail, so someone on board must have sabotaged it. To this day, it remains unclear who that person was, but it was clear that the men were being watched from the skies by British surveillance, who were perhaps tipped off by US intelligence, who were surveilling Libyan ports. So the largest shipment had been secured, but what of the four remaining shipments which had already entered Ireland? The Libyan Semtex explosive would go on to be used in many, if not all, of the IRA bombs that would take place over the next few years. But one of the most devastating attacks would take place just over one week after the capture of the Exund, in the small town of Enniskillen in Northern Ireland.
On Saturday night, November 7th, it was one week after the seizure of the Exund, the provisional IRA set a plan in motion. A £50 bomb was brought to the outskirts of Enniskillen. It's believed that three units of the IRA took part in the preparation, with at least one unit based in the Republic of Ireland. One would provide the timer, and one would also prepare the bomb. The bomb was a Semtex explosive, which came from one of the previous arms shipments from Libya. IRA members then travelled ahead of the bomb to make sure that there was no checkpoints along the way. As well as that, some IRA sympathisers were also dotted around Enniskillen to watch out for the army. The reading rooms in Enniskillen was a social club located directly beside the Enniskillen War Memorial Monument. I've read accounts that it was dilapidated, and the IRA actually used the building to build bombs as far back as 1972. According to the BBC documentary, on this evening, a caretaker was inside, finishing up a game of cards with some friends, before locking up for the night. He heard what sounded like muffled footsteps upstairs, but thought nothing of it and finished up his game. Upstairs, the bomb was being placed against the gable wall of the building, on the side which looked out at the war memorial. The bomb was timed to go off the following day at 10.43am in the morning, during the ceremony which was to happen directly outside. The following morning, a crowd of people gathered to watch the military band play and the wreath-laying ceremony. The gable wall of the reading room was quite a popular position for people to stand, as it offered the best view of what was going on. No one could have possibly known there was a bomb laying on the other side of the wall. The British Army had swept the route of the military parade for bombs, multiple times, but they didn't check the inside of the reading rooms, as it was thought to be a sealed, secure area. Julian Armstrong was there with his parents, and his father liked to get the good position in front of the reading rooms. He would get there early so as to get the best view. And Julian was standing with his mother on his left and his father on his right. His dad mentioned something about an umbrella, and at that exact moment, at 10.43, the bomb detonated. The bomb collapsed the entire building, with stone and masonry falling and crushing the people standing underneath it, trapping them between the falling masonry and a metal railing which was on the footpath. There were scenes of utter chaos, with people running up to the rubble to pull off the injured, but stepping on others who were concealed. Some footage was captured in the immediate aftermath of the bombing. Witnesses describe a moment of silence in the seconds following the bomb, before all hell broke loose. Bodies were scattered around the road, some with coats over them, showing that they were dead, and then there was a race to move the rubble to find more survivors. Julian then describes what happened when he first found his mother, and then when he found his father. I went to my mother, who was, um, who was under the rubble lying flat, with her arms at the side, just like that. I just took all the bricks off her as quick as possible, just threw them to the side, and was just doing it frantically as possible. And from what I'd seen of her, I just knew she was dead. Uh, I wouldn't like to describe what I've seen, but um, it was like something out of a horror movie, basically, and this, the blood was everywhere. I turned right to my, my dad, and he had a concrete slab pressed up against him, against the, the railing. And it was a very heavy concrete slab, and I tried to push it, but there was no budge in it. And I just remember the life going out of him, more than his nerves, endings, shaking. And now I knew he was dead as well as he was just facing me with his eyes closed. Did it register at the time that, you're, that you'd lost your parents? I accepted at that point. From what I'd seen, there was no way my mother could have lived. And I knew my dad was dead as well. I, I kind of accepted at that point. I didn't, wasn't in denial about it. Oh, maybe they'll still be alive. But I just knew at that point they were dead and I was kind of what am I going to do, basically, I was thinking. Both of Julian's parents, 62-year-old Wesley and 52-year-old Bertha Armstrong, were killed in the attack. Two other elderly couples were killed. 
71-year-old Kit and 62-year-old Jesse Johnson, 74-year-old William and 73-year-old Agnes Mullen. Alongside the three couples, five others were killed. John McGaw, 67, Alberta Quinton, 72, Samuel Galt, 49, Edward Armstrong, 52, and 20-year-old Marie Wilson. Marie Wilson's father, Gordon, described what happened as the two lay on the ground after the blast. This speech was broadcast in the mainstream media all over the world, and it particularly struck a chord with the people in the Republic of Ireland. This one's a difficult listen, just a heads up. And then I was aware of somebody squeezing my hand. And Mary said, is that you, Dad? And I said, yes. She said, are you all right? I said, yes, but my hand's sore. How are you, dear? All right. And I heard her scream. Asked her again, how are you, Mary? Are you all right? Yes. She was gripping my hand very tightly. I was bleeding from the forehead. You had hurt myself. But I was as assured that she was all right. She told me twice. She told me again, but she still was screaming in between times, and I couldn't understand why on the one hand she was telling me she was all right, on the other hand she was screaming. When I asked her for the fourth or fifth time, she said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were the last words she spoke. I should never forget them. In the wake of the attacks, Gordon stated that he had no ill will towards the bombers and that he would pray for them, and he pleaded with loyalists not to retaliate after this attack. The total number of dead was 12, but this eventually rose to 13 after Ronnie Hill died after spending 13 years in a coma after the bombing. 63 people were injured, including 13 children, and some were left with permanent disabilities from the attack. So how did an attack like this happen? In theory, the IRA usually didn't target civilians, not necessarily for compassionate grounds, but they knew that it would be terrible for their PR. That being said, civilians usually bore the brunt of provisional IRA attacks. But there was no way that this bomb wouldn't kill civilians. A member of the PSNI spoke in the BBC documentary, saying that according to their information, there was deliberation within senior levels of the IRA, where the chance to kill members of the security forces was weighed up against the risk of killing civilians, and it was decided to go ahead with the bombing. Again, this is murky territory. There's a high chance that those who made the decision to continue with the bombing had no idea where the IRA cell would place the bomb, and where the bomb ended up was all but guaranteed to kill civilians. It should be noted that the Lockall ambush had taken place just five months earlier, which saw members of the IRA killed by the British Army while attempting to attack a barracks, and I did come across one source as saying that this was a retaliation attack for that. Then there was also the capture of the Exund, which had just happened a few days earlier. Perhaps this was an attempt to show that the IRA still had strength. In the wake of the attacks, the IRA tried to blame the British Army, saying that their radio sweep for bomb signals had set off the bomb prematurely. The British Army responded by providing proof that the bomb was a mechanical timer, and that timer could have only been set by the hand of an IRA man. There is also another strange thing which occurred a few days after the bombing, but it was only released to the public in 2018. The Irish government received an anonymous letter by someone who claimed to be an MI5 operative. This operative claimed that British intelligence was aware of the bomb in Enniskillen, but chose to do nothing about it, as they believed it would create a massive backlash. I couldn't really find any other information about this letter. An explanation like this may have been an attempt to take some of the blame for the bombing off the IRA, but it's unclear if it was taken seriously by authorities. It appears that this was only one of two attacks which were planned on the day. Hours after the Enniskillen blast, the IRA placed a phone call to a radio station, saying that they had planted a second bomb in another village, but that it hadn't detonated. 20 miles from Enniskillen, another Remembrance Day parade was taking place in a small border village called Tullyhaman. 
This bomb was significantly larger than the one which went off in Enniskillen and had a command wire attached to it, meaning it could be detonated from a distance. The wire snaked a fair distance into the Republic of Ireland. So presumably somebody was waiting at the other end to trigger the bomb. The parade that was being targeted had many members of the Boys and Girls Brigade, as well as some members of the security services. It appears that the IRA had attempted to trigger the bomb when soldiers were standing beside it, but failed, perhaps due to a fault in the bomb. The BBC documentary mentions a tractor driving across the command wire, which could have unintentionally prevented a second devastating bombing. The bomb was defused by security services. Many nationalists and nationalist organisations said that this attack gravely injured the IRA's cause. The IRA were quick to apologise and said that their target was Ulster Defence Regiment soldiers marching in the parade. But many rejected this apology. The Sinn Féin newspaper, on Fublucht, said that this bombing was a monumental error. Prime Minister of the UK at the time, Margaret Thatcher, issued a statement that appeared to be speaking to countries who support the IRA, perhaps to the US or Libya. It was so appalling, really I could scarcely believe it, because anyone who would do such a terrible thing would be condemned the world over by every nation, and I hope that will happen, and no help to them. No matter if any countries had sympathy with them before, no help to them now, not ever. There was also a response out of Libya, as the bomb in Enniskillen was composed of Libyan-supplied Semtex. Their official press association issued a denunciation of the bombing, saying, quote, Libya is aware of the difference between legitimate revolutionary action and terrorism aimed at civilians and innocent people. This action does not belong to the legitimate revolutionary operations. Alan Jukes, who was the leader of the political party Fine Gael in the Republic of Ireland, said of the IRA, quote, These rats are now scurrying for cover in the sewers of their own violence. There were also some significant responses in popular culture. The Simple Mind song, Belfast's Child, is inspired by the Enniskillen bombing. As well as that, the world-renowned band U2 were performing in Denver, Colorado on the day of the bombing, and the lead singer Bono condemned the actions of the bombers. They also performed at San Francisco multiple times in 1987, and in one instance, Bono saw someone in the crowd waving a flag with the letters SF on it, and he expressed his anger. It turns out that in this context, the flag was for San Francisco and not for Sinn Féin. The Enniskillen bombing was unjustifiable and indefensible, and deeply damaged any sympathy that any country had around the globe would have for the IRA before this point. The cell responsible for the bombing ended up getting disbanded, and in the weeks after the bombing, loyalists in Northern Ireland ended up retaliating and shooting a number of Catholic teenagers, 
one Protestant teenager was killed after he was mistaken for a Catholic. There were also 14 gun and bomb attacks around Belfast. So what were the larger consequences of this bombing? Well, Republicans had lost a lot of support, and many see this as a turning point in the Troubles that would begin the long road towards a peace agreement. Ed Maloney writes in his book, The Secret History of the IRA, that in the nine months following in Eskillen, the IRA were responsible for killing 18 civilians, and their cause was becoming harder and harder to support. So much so that even Jerry Adams, who was the leader of Sinn Féin at the time, began to create distance, saying that Sinn Féin's position was one of critical support for the IRA. Only a few years before this, all Sinn Féin candidates were required to give complete support to the IRA. Like I mentioned earlier, Libya also withdrew their support for the IRA and would no longer send any more shipments of weapons or money. There was still concern though, as there were still four shipments hiding buried somewhere in the Republic of Ireland. And the threat of these shipments may have sped up the need for a UK government to seek a peaceful solution for the ongoing violence. The skipper of the Exund, Adrian Hopkins, spent five years in prison for his role in importing the weapons, and never did write that book. Two weeks after the Enniskillen bombing, a second parade took place, which 5,000 people attended, including Margaret Thatcher. And today, a business centre known as the Clinton Centre sits on the site of the bombing, which was opened by Bill Clinton when he visited in 2002. On Remembrance Day in 1997, Jerry Adams publicly apologised for the bombing, but as of writing, the trail quickly ran cold and nobody has ever been convicted for the Enniskillen bombing. Gordon Wilson, who lost his daughter Marie, went on to meet with the IRA after one of their bombs killed two young boys in Warrington in 1993 and he asked them to stop with these attacks. He went on to say that his efforts had been quite pointless and that some Protestants never forgave him for talking to the IRA. Gordon went on to establish a community outreach program in Enniskillen and then was invited to become a senator and join the Irish Shannad in 1993. The Shannad is essentially an advisory role when compared to the elected doll. Gordon lost his son Peter in a traffic accident in 1995 and then died from a heart attack just a few months later. The families of those killed in IRA bombs in Northern Ireland have attempted to sue the country of Libya a number of times for supplying the explosives which killed their loved ones. As of writing, a few attempts have been made, but none have yet been successful. I'm sure the campaigners won't give up in their quest to get some sort of justice for the loss in their lives. That's it for me. Thanks and see you next time. If you are enjoying this podcast and want to support what I do, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash the troubles podcast. Patreons get early ad free episodes. And as well as that, I also release a companion video after each episode, talking about the episode itself, as well as any recent news related to Northern Ireland. You can also buy me a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com forward slash troubles podcast. If you would like to support the podcast in other ways, you can also leave a review or simply tell your friends. It all helps. Thanks and see you next time.